Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to provide a demonstration of growth curve modeling using IBM SPSS. The example provided here is based on that which is presented in a book called Growth Modeling, Structural Equation and Multi-Level Modeling Approaches by Grimm et al. So a link to the book and the companion website can be found uh, basically right here. And also a copy of the SPSS file that I put together for this demonstration can be downloaded at this site right here. Let me just note that the book itself covers M+, SAS, and the R package in LME. So I'm basically pivoting off of that by using their example and, and uh, their data, but uh, running the analyses through SPSS. I'm going to include a link to this PowerPoint as well as uh, the links I just went over underneath the video description so that you can basically access the book site as well as the SPSS data file that I'm using in this presentation. So for our examples, we will be using longitudinal data from the Center for Human Resource Research um, uh, cited as 2004 by Grimm et al. So we're going to be modeling change over time in mathematics achievement. Our time indicator will be students grade at testing and the data are arranged in long format. So we have the repeated measurements on math nested within students. So you'll notice that we have uh, in this um, shot right here you can see we have ID these are the student identifiers you'll see that row 1 and row 2 both have the same student identifier um, so we have student 201 um, that student in grade 3 and then again in grade 5 then we have math achievement scores for grade 3 and grade 5 and so forth then then we have student uh, 303 measured on math scores in grades 2 and 5 and so forth so basically, the students' assessments took place between grades uh, 2 through uh, 8. And the students' assessments, uh, actually the number of assessments did vary due to differences in uh, random and non-random patterns of data missingness, as well as partially due to the assessment protocol as reflected uh, by Grimm et al. So for our demonstrations, we also are going to take the grade variable and center it so that the first uh, or initial status, if you will, in terms of the grade assessment is going to be grade two. So basically uh, to do this, uh, I basically created this variable right here, grade two, by essentially using the compute function and taking the grade variable and subtracting uh, two from it so that uh, essentially, an individual who was first assessed at grade two will have a value of zero. That's essentially the initial uh, time measurement occasion. Then a value of one is a person who was measured at grade three and so forth. And this has relevance later when we start talking about interpreting the intercepts for our models. So really briefly, here's our data. This is the grade two variable. I'll just go ahead and delete that and show you really quickly how that was computed. Uh, we just went to uh, transform compute variable and uh, what we'll do is we'll just call this uh, grade underscore two, if I can put the underscore in there correctly. Okay, and then we'll say uh, numeric expression, we'll say grade minus two and hit OK. And so now when we look at this, you can see there's our variable that has been created. Also, let's take a quick look at the uh, growth trajectories for a subgroup of our, um, of our students. So what we'll do is uh, let's look at the growth trajectories for uh, the students up through 23701. And so the ID variable, by the way, is, is um, ordered. And so uh, we're going to look at the uh, essentially the uh, first assessment period as well as the slopes uh, modeled in a linear fashion for everybody up to uh, subject or uh, 23701. So what we'll do is go to data, select cases, we'll click on if condition is satisfied and then click, click the if button. We'll move ID over here and I'm going to say any subject with an ID less than 24402 which is the next uh, person in our data set. So I'm going to say 24402 We'll hit uh, continue and then on OK. And so now you'll see that um, basically everyone up to um, 24402, everyone uh, with an identifier below that is basically filtered out. So we'll go through graphs, legacy dialogs, scatter dot, 
We'll click on Simple Scatter and Define, and we'll move the ID variable down to the Set Markers By box. We'll move Math Scores, which is our uh, dependent variable, over to the Y axis here. And then we'll move the Grade 2 variable to the X axis and then click on OK. And so now you'll see that we have um, uh, a graph, a scatter plot, uh, with, uh, the I with the individual cases uh, with their unique identifiers in different colors. And so I'm going to double click on this and click on this button right here for add line at subgroups. We'll click on that. And so now you'll see that uh, it looks like a mess, but basically this is an attempt by the program to fit a linear uh, growth trajectory to each of the uh, individual students' um, math scores over time. I'm also going to get rid of this attached label to line and uh, click on apply right here so that I can kind of clean it up a little bit. We'll click on close and we'll close this out. And so now you can see as we're looking at this that uh, you know this is basically our first measurement. This is grade two. This is grade three, grade four, grade five, grade six, grade seven, and grade eight. And so you'll notice that at grade two that we have essentially variation uh, in the predicted uh, scores with respect to math achievement. Uh, you'll notice that not every student uh, was measured at grade two, but we do have essentially predicted intercepts uh, for each of these lines right here. So that's what I was kind of referring to before about not all uh, measurements had occurred at all uh, occasions. But so these are basically going to be the intercepts for the individual students' uh, growth trajectories. And then you can see the slopes vary as well. So you can see, for instance, this person right here has a, a slightly positive uh, slope, uh, so some, some growth over time. You'll see that this person right here has much more substantial uh, change over time, a positive growth over time. You actually have this person exhibiting maybe a slight negative um, uh, change over time. So at any rate, at this point, what we're going to do is we are going to go ahead and uh, run an initial model. And that model is just basically going to be called a null model or no growth model. And in this particular case, what we have, we have two equations that we want to um, represent our data with. So the level one equation, you'll see I've got yti here equals pi zero i uh, subscripted and then plus epsilon ti right here. So basically what this is saying is that at time t, student i's math score, which is our y uh, variable right here, this is our outcome, is equal to the student's mean, that's basically the math score averaged over time, plus a time-specific deviation from that mean, and that's what uh, this residual is right here. Then for a level two equation, you'll notice that we have the student's uh, mean math score, again, that's been averaged over time, is equal to the average of all students' uh, math scores that have been uh, computed over time, plus that student's deviation from the grand mean of those, of those math scores. So through substitution, we end up with this equation right here. So basically, if we substitute uh, this part um, our, of our level two equation in for pi within level one, that's what yields our uh, combined equation. So let's go ahead and run our model. First off, um, again, we've already selected out uh, all the observations um, with IDs that are above 23701. So I actually want to uh, select them back in. So I'm going to go back to Select Cases, click on All Cases, and then OK. So now everyone is back uh, selected um, into our uh, data set for our analysis. So next I'll go to Analyze, Mix Models, go down to Linear, and I'm going to go ahead and reset this and walk you through it. So we're going to move the uh, ID over to the subjects box. Then we want to have uh, essentially an indicator of the repeated measurements. Um, so we're, what we're going to do is we're going to move uh, grade or grade two over here. This is just basically kind of an index variable as well as it's going to be a predictor in our model. And you'll notice that when we do this, down here, this highlights. So you got repeated covariance type and the default is diagonal. And I'm not going to really go into a lot of this uh, right now, but basically I'm going to go ahead and set this as scaled identity. And what this has to do with is how we want to treat the residuals at level one. Um, basically, we have repeated measurements 
um, across the, the different time points. And so we want to figure out, do we want to treat the variances of the residuals at level one as being uh, equal or unequal? Do we, how do we want to treat uh, the covariance between them? So I'm going to start off with basically just a very simplified uh, repeated covariance type, which is a scaled identity, which basically assumes um, that the variances of the level one residuals are all equal, and then th there's no covariance um, among them, which really is largely, you know, it's oftentimes an untenable assumption uh, when you're dealing with data such as this. But again, we're just going to kind of keep this uh, simple for the time being. So we'll click on continue, and we're going to move our math variable over to the dependent variable box. Next, we'll click under uh, Fix, and you'll notice that there's no predictors that we've included, so there's not really much to, to do in this case. Just keep in mind that we want to leave this box checked, so the Include Intercept box. Next, we'll go to Random, and we're going to move the ID variable over to Combinations right here, and then we'll click on Include Intercept. And so what we're going to be doing is we're allowing the intercepts to randomly vary across individuals. And the intercepts within that formula we were talking about were essentially the person mean. So for each individual in our data set, uh, we'll, uh, we would have a uh, predicted uh, mean uh, with, uh, over time. And so what we're going to do now is allow those uh, person-level means, or intercepts in this case, to randomly vary. So to do this, we have to click this box where that says Include Intercept. Uh, we're going to leave our covariance type set at Variance Components uh, and then click on Continue. We'll go to Estimation, and we have a couple of options that are available to us. I'm going to go ahead and click on Maximum Likelihood, then Continue. Uh, under statistics, we'll click on parameter estimates for fixed effects, test for covariance parameters, and covariances of random effects. And then we'll click on continue here, and then on OK. And so now we'll take a look at our output. So first off, you'll notice that we have a model dimension table up here. And so you have a description of the parameters that are being estimated. So first off, you'll see under fixed effects, this is essentially our um, our uh, our person-specific uh, intercept, or the grand mean of the person-specific intercepts, which we uh, denoted uh, with the beta subscript 00. zero. So I'm just going to say beta subscript 00, zero right here. Then you'll see that we have uh, the random effects for the intercept right here. So we have one parameter that's being estimated here. So this is actually going to be the variance of those person-specific intercepts. So I'm going to denote this as sigma squared with a little uh, subscript of mu zero j, or mu zero i, excuse me, uh, for this demonstration. Then for the repeated effects down here, uh, this is basically we're estimating the variance of the level one residual. So that is uh, essentially going to be, we'll denote it as sigma squared with our epsilon ij right here. So when we sum up those, we get three total parameters that are being estimated in our model. So I will scroll down and we'll take a look first off at the fixed effects box. You can see right here, this is our beta zero zero. So this is the uh, grand mean of the student um, uh, means, if you will. Um, and so essentially the average, uh, if we take uh, you know, all the students' uh, scores in terms of math achievement and we average them out for each person over time, and then we average the aver those averages, then the, we would say that the average math uh, score, math achievement score, uh, is going to be 45.91. So that's the predicted um, average math score within the sample. And so basically using our equation for the combined model right here, this is uh, the combined model I, I showed you earlier. So if I substitute that value in, this is uh, what it would look like. So again, this is um, es essentially the average of the person-specific intercepts um, uh, for our sample. So then when we move to our next uh, piece of output, we have estimates of covariance parameters. So basically, this is the variance estimate at level one. So again, that's our sigma uh, squared with our epsilon, um, you know, essentially uh, TI right here. And then we also have our uh, variance estimate for the intercept. So it's sigma squared right here. 
and then we have uh, mu, and then basically zero i right here. And I think I've uh, earlier, I think I inadvertently uh, referred to maybe ij for our uh, residuals at level one, and that's just partly because uh, that was actually sort of the notation typically associated with uh, more of a cross-sectional design in, instead of sort of this longitudinal model. So uh, this is actually the correct term that I should have used earlier. So basically, we can say that the variance of the residuals at level one, this is our, you know, we have a, a walled Z test, which is a test um, determining whether or not we have significant variation at level one. And um, essentially, uh, if, if we have a significance for this particular test, and that indicates that we have significant variability um, uh, at level one. So we could theoretically add in additional predictors to try to account for that variation. Then we also have our variance estimate at level two for our intercepts, and you can see it's statistically significant as well. So this would tell us that perhaps we can add in uh, predictors at level two that may help to account for variation uh, between individuals with respect to uh, math achievement scores. So now let's add in a level, our, our uh, grade two variable as a predictor of math scores. So this is, uh, and, and basically the grade two variable is going to be treated as a linear um, predictor of math scores. So in other words, we're predicting linear change over time. So in this equation right here, our level one equation, you can see that we have our person-specific intercept, but now we're adding in our uh, grade two predictor. And so you can see that the regression uh, coefficient for the level one equation is, um, our, the slope is essentially uh, pi uh, with a subscript of one and then i. Now, because we've added in uh, the grade two variable, which has been centered at, at, uh, at um, essentially grade two, uh, what that means then is that our intercept then becomes the predicted uh, math achievement score for students uh, at grade two. So that's a little bit different from what we had before where we were uh, essentially looking at the intercept as being the average um, math achievement score for a given student over uh, the measurement occasions. So simply put, we can say that student I score at time T um, equals the student's intercept, which is the predicted score for second grade, uh, plus the predicted annual change in math achievement, which is denoted as pi subscripted 1i, and that's for student i, plus a time-specific residual, so uh, which is the difference between predicted score in second grade and the student's actual score in second grade. Then we have the level two equations that are given right here. So now you'll notice that because we have the uh, pi subscripted 0i and then the pi subscripted 1i, then basically, first off, we had essentially the same interpretation that we had before, that basically the person-specific intercept um, is equal to the grand mean of the person-specific intercepts plus the deviation of that person's intercept from the grand mean of those intercepts. And just remember, once again, that we're talking about the, the uh, person's uh, predicted score, uh, math achievement score at grade two. Uh, the next one right here, you'll see that uh, the pi 1i is equal to beta subscript 1, 0. And this is essentially treating the regression slope, reflecting uh, the effect of uh, grade 2 on our outcome variable as being constant across individuals. So um, that we're just essentially modeling this as a fixed effect. So we're, we're essentially treating this as indicating that the rate of change in linear growth is is the same across individuals. Later on, we'll add in a um, a, uh, a a residual term, which would be uh, plus mu one i, and that would capture the notion that the slopes may vary across individuals. But we're not doing that in this particular case. So at this point, we'll go ahead and, and run our model. So we'll go back to uh, analyze mixed models and go down to linear. Uh, we'll leave everything the same, except now we're going to move grade 2 over to the covariates box. And under fixed, we'll click on grade 2 and move it over as well. 
And so again, we'll leave everything the same. There's our random box. We're going to leave that alone. Uh, later on, when we want to at, uh, allow the slope for the grade two predictor to randomly vary across individuals, then we would click add right here and move it over. But we're not going to do that in this particular uh, part of the demonstration. So now when we're looking at our model uh, characteristics, you can see that now we have a fixed effect concerning the intercept. That's the grand mean of the person uh, specific intercepts, or basically the grand mean of the predicted um, grade two math achievement scores. And then we have the fixed effect for grade. Um, so now we have two parameters uh, that, are, uh, that are being treated as fixed effects. We still have our uh, variance estimate for the intercept and then also the variance estimate for the level one residuals as well. So now we have four total parameters that are being estimated for our model. So when we scroll down, you can see right here that uh, this right here is uh, the estimated um, math achievement score uh, for students in second grade. So remember that grade two, because we uh, coded that first measurement occasion zero, then essentially that is the predicted score for uh, second graders. Then we see the regression slope, which is 4.293523. Uh, so it's a positive um, value, and so that would indicate that basically for every uh, year um, beyond the second grade, we would uh, predict an increase of 4.29, roughly 4.294 uh, in math achievement. You can see that that predictor is statistically significant. When we look at the estimates of covariance parameters, you can see our level one variance is still statistically significant, as is the variance of the intercepts. Uh, at level two. Okay, so now let's try a model where we are allowing the slopes for the grade two variable to randomly vary across individuals. And if we do this, what we're essentially doing is we're saying that perhaps the uh, linear rate of change varies across individuals. So not everybody necessarily exhibits um, the same uh, degree of change across years. So we specify that by modifying our level two equation for the, um, the slope for grade two to include both the fixed um, effect right here, which is essentially the average slope across all individuals, plus a random component. So basically this is the deviation from, this is the deviation of a given person's uh, slope from the grand mean of those slopes. So we're essentially allowing the slope, uh, the slopes for each individual to randomly vary. So to run our analysis, we'll go to Analyze, Mixed Models, Linear, and we'll just leave everything the same way, but now we'll go under Random and we'll move Grade 2 over to this box and click on Add. And so now we have kind of another issue at play. You know, I mentioned before about the covariance type at level one, well, we also now have a covariance type at level two that we have to focus on. When we only had variation in the intercepts that we were really considering, we only had one variance that could be estimated. And now um, that we are allowing the slope to randomly vary, now we have another uh, variance component that we uh, can estimate. Uh, in addition, it's also possible that we could have a covariance between the intercepts and slopes uh, at level two. So I want to briefly just run the analysis uh, with the uh, covariance type set to variance components. Basically, it's the same as a diagonal uh, covariance matrix. And what that means is that we're going to estimate the variance of the intercepts and the slopes, um, but we're also going to uh, assume that the uh, that essentially the slopes and the intercepts do not covary, so the covariance is zero. So I'm going to click on continue and then on OK just to give you an idea. Um, pretty much uh, most of our interpretations are going to be uh, the same as what we had before with respect to our fixed effects. But now under estimates of covariance parameters, now you can see that we have essentially the variance of the residuals at level one. So again, there's our sigma squared um, with our subscript of uh, epsilon uh, T and I right there for uh, this component. So you can see that that is statistically significant. Then we have the variance of the intercepts right here. 
Uh, and then we also have, I'm not going to bother draw, uh, writing this in again notationally, but basically this is the variance of the slopes right here. And you can see that we have statistical significance. So what that tells us is that you know both our intercepts and our slopes are uh, significantly varying across individuals. So we have two uh, growth curve parameters that are uh, where we have evidence of variation across individuals. And uh, let me just say once again that um, you can, when you download the PowerPoint, you're going to see a lot more description on uh, many of these models that I'm running. So just don't forget that. All right, so the other option, or another option, if we were going to specify our level two um, uh, random effects, another option in SPSS is to specify an unstructured matrix. And what that means is, if we click on this, what this would do is our theoretically should do is to estimate both the variance of the intercepts, the slopes, and then also the covariance between the two. Now, in this most recent edition of um, SPSS, or at least the version I have, um, there is an error or a bug in here where basically if you uh, click on unstructured right here, we click on continue and then on OK, what's going to happen is it's going to treat the variance covariance matrix at level two as essentially a scaled uh, identity matrix. And um, so it's actually inaccurate. So there is a workaround that I can show you. Uh, essentially, if we uh, go back, we've already, you know, kind of specified everything um, as as we would, but again, it's not reading this correct uh, with respect to the covariance type. But what we can do is we can use the paste function and generate the syntax for the model and just make that little change right here where it says random intercept and then you've got grade two. This is uh, essentially treating the slope for the grade two variable as um, as randomly varying. So where it says covariance type, what I'm going to do is I am going to type in UN for unstructured. And so now when I run the model this way, I'm just going to highlight it and click on run. Now you can see that we have our estimates of covariance parameters. And so now you can see UN11, that is uh, giving us the variance of the intercepts. You can see it's significant. Uh, UN22, that's the variance of the slopes, that's significant. And then the 21, this is the covariance between uh, the intercepts and slopes. And you can see that it's not statistically significant. So really what this uh, you know, kind of highlights is that um, it's probably worthwhile to consider just um, uh, adopting a simpler covariance structure at level two. But again, you know, uh, in, the, in our particular case, uh, again, there is a bug in the system. Uh, and I haven't yet seen a patch or anything for it. Uh, so if you are trying to kind of uh, run a model and it doesn't give you the, the correct covariance parameter, you can actually uh, make a couple of modifications with the syntax and you should be uh, good to go. So at this point, it looks like we have evidence uh, that there is significant variation across uh, students in terms of their grade two math achievement scores. Uh, we do see that the average uh, change across students is 4.339, um, you know, for, um, uh, over time. That's the uh, rate of change over time. But there's also significant variation uh, across students in terms of the, um, the, the, their uh, slopes for the grade two variable. So given the evidence that we have variation in the intercepts and slopes, we might wish to try to model uh, that variation. Before we do that, let me just kind of uh, really briefly show you some of those other level one um, uh, residual variants of covariance types. So I'm going to go back and you can see right here we've been using scaled identity. If we scroll up and we use the diagonal uh, covariance type and click on continue and then on OK, you'll notice in this case uh, basically, we have the variances. There's the at uh, grade two, three, four, and so forth. So these are um, the level one residual variances, and you can see that all of these variances are uniquely estimated. Whereas before, when we use the scaled identity um, covariance um, matrix uh, at level one, we were essentially assuming equality of all of those variances. So that's uh, the diagonal um, covariance matrix at level one. Uh, there are other options as well. Another possibility is to uh, utilize an AR1. This is autoregressive uh, model. And so in this case right here, if we click on this, 
then what you'll see is, uh, well, in this case, it looks like we have um, a problem with uh, model convergence. But basically what happens in this case would be, uh, if, if the model did converge, uh, we would have essentially a, a common variance estimate and then a, an, an estimate of the autocorrelation as well as the level one residual variance as well. But you can see uh, right here that we have essentially um, uh, the diagonal, this is the variance estimate, and then this is the autocorrelation uh, that's given right here. And you can see right here that um, our estimate of the variation um, at, at level two uh, actually uh, tanked. Uh, once again, because I didn't stick with the unstructured matrix, it, it actually just kind of defaulted back in the same way that I was mentioning before. So it's a little aggravating that there's that bug in this system um, that, I'm, that you can see right here. So at any rate, let's move on to our next topic. And uh, just actually, I'm going to take one more side step back. This is where I'd rerun the analysis using that syntax correction. So you can see right here, there's the A1, uh, AR1 diagonal. There's the variance estimate. And then we have the uh, autocorrelation estimate right there. And then we have the variance of the uh, intercepts and slopes right uh, here. And I think in this case, I just set, had set this to uh, the variance components. Um, approach. Basically a diagonal matrix at level two. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to add in a couple of additional predictors. So we're going to add in two predictors. One is uh, at level two, we're going to uh, predict variation in the uh, student intercepts. So basically the grade two, the predicted grade two math scores for students. Uh, with the first predictor being a low birth weight variable. So it's a dichotomous variable uh, coded zero for non-low birth weight, one for low birth weight. And then the second uh, predictor is called antisocial. So it's an indicator. It's basically treated as a continuous measure of the degree to which a student exhibited antisocial behavior in kindergarten. So we're going to predict, again, variation in the student intercepts. And then we're also going to include a, a predictor, these two variables as predictors of variation in the slopes. And when we do this, uh, particularly when we're talking about predicting variation in the slopes, we're going to be essentially modeling cross-level interactions. So what we'll do is we'll go back up to Analyze, go to Mixed Models, Linear. Um, I'm going to keep this really simple just by setting this uh, to uh, Scaled Identity at Level 1. And we'll click on continue right there. We'll move our predictors over. So our predictors include uh, the low birth weight variable. I'm going to move it to the covariance box as well as the anti-K1. You'll notice that um, uh, right now uh, it's kind of registering. These variables are registering as being nominal. But essentially it's not going to make any difference in terms of running the analysis. Um, but uh, just kind of keep in mind that the low birth weight variable is a dichotomous variable. So it's perfectly permissible to treat it as a covariate within our model. So next up, uh, again, under random, we have grade two already moved over. So we're going to try to predict that variation in the uh, slopes of grade two. And I'm going to set this covariance type uh, back to, um, I mean, I can set it to diagonal or variance components. It's going to give me the same thing. Um, but uh, and now this this should work out with that without uh, the bug uh, creating problems. So next we'll click on continue and go to fixed. And I'm going to move each of these variables over uh, to the box on the right. So I'm adding those. And then uh, there's a couple of ways that you could do this. You can either click on this button right here, and then uh, essentially we're going to model cross-level interaction. So I can say low birth weight. I click on this button by grade two and uh, click on that. And so you can see it highlights down below with build term and then click on add. Um, and then we'll, uh, another option is just to uh, simply leave it as factorial and then just highlight uh, your two variables like I'm doing right here and then click on add and it works the same way. So we'll click on uh, continue right there. And then at this point, we will uh, leave everything the same way it was before, and we'll click on OK. So now you can see with our model dimension table, we have nine total parameters that are being estimated. Included in this is the cross-level interaction between low birth weight and the grade 2 variable and the uh, antisocial variable and the grade 2 variable. So we have essentially these two uh, uh, 
these two parameters are being estimated. You can see that the, for the random effects for the intercept and grade, we have two parameters that are estimated. That's the variances for each of those. Again, we weren't sticking with the unstructured uh, matrix, so we don't have a, a covariance between them that's being estimated. For the repeated effects, uh, that's our level one residuals right there. Because we selected the scale I, scaled identity approach um, for the repeated covariance type, we only have one parameter estimated there. Then again, we have our uh, uh, grand mean of the intercepts, the grand mean of the regression slopes uh, for the grade two variable, uh, our level two uh, predictor low birth weight predicting variation in the intercepts, and our level two um, predictor of the um, anti-social uh, variable predicting variation in the intercepts right there. So now we'll kind of scroll down and take a look at our estimates of fixed effects. And so we can interpret the intercept uh, as the predicted math score for students in grade two who are not low birth weight. So basically those individuals were coded zero on the low birth weight variable and who scored zero on the antisocial behavior scale. So um, basically that's this value right there for the intercept. Then we have the grade two slope, which is this one right here. So we can say that you can see that statistically significant. That indicates a predicted increase in math score of 4.31 points for each passing year for essentially the non-birth weight, non-low birth weight students. The slope for the low birth weight, which is the negative 2.717, uh, that is statistically significant, so it's 0 .036, and that indicates that students who were low in birth weight were predicted to score 2.72 points lower uh, in grade two than those students who were not low in birth weight. And then the slope for the uh, anti-social uh, predictor basically indicates that students differing by one point on the antisocial behavior scale were predicted to differ by 0.55 points on math achievement in second grade. So for instance, a student receiving a one on the antisocial behavior scale would be predicted to score 0.55 points lower in second grade than a student receiving uh, a zero on that scale. Now briefly, with respect to the cross-level interactions, you can see right here we have grade two by low birth weight. And so you can see this is the estimate right here. And you can see that it's actually not statistically significant within this model. You, I guess you could say it's near significant. Um, and then also for the grade two by antisocial uh, predictor, you can see that that's also not significant. Now even though um, the interaction between grade two and, and low birth weight was not significant. I do spend some time in the PowerPoint unpacking this. So that's all of this description right here. So I'm going to leave that to you uh, to review that, uh, that uh, discussion. And then finally, we still have significant variation in the level one residuals that could be explained by additional predictors, perhaps through the inclusion of time varying covariates. We also have significant variation in the intercepts and significant variation in the slopes. So perhaps through the inclusion of additional predictors at level two, we might be able to explain um, uh, additional variation in the students' predicted math achievement scores as well as their slopes for the grade two predictor. Okay, so that uh, pretty well covers this demonstration. It was a lot of territory. And uh, once again, I do encourage you to download uh, the data and this PowerPoint, and you can go through it a lot more um, uh, thoroughly than what I was able to really cover in this particular video. But I do appreciate you watching, and um, stay tuned for other videos.